Welcome to Lemonade Learning, a refreshing look at learning today. We serve up high impact practical strategies alongside honest and energizing stories to help educators. Make the most of your moments, lead and learn with purpose and craft lifetime lemonade from the sweets and sours of education. Join us for a glass. Hey everybody, it's Bree. And Lainey, welcome. We have Dave Burgess, and normally I toss to you for the intro if you know the person, um, or I intro if I know, we both know this person. I think everyone knows this person. Is that fair? I think it's fair, and I don't even really think we have to introduce him because I don't think there's a person that could possibly be listening in the world that doesn't know who the Dave Burgess is, right? Educator, New York Times bestseller, entrepreneur, Dave. Pirate. Pirate. Dave, how would you like to introduce yourself? Why don't you say hi and tell the folks who you are in case hey, they live under a rock and don't know who you are? <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm excited. As you both know, I'm a fan of your podcast. And so it's an honor to be on it. And uh, we'll, hey, we'll just go with, we'll just go with Dave Burgess and we'll go from there. We'll just roll with it. Well, if they didn't know your greatness before, again, unlikely, um, they will very soon. So we're super excited to talk to you, and you you know how this goes, because you are so kind that you have listened to our show. You know this it's coming. This is my favorite part. Like, I definitely feel like, you know, there are a few moments when you're growing up that you think, like, when you are kind of, quote, unquote, in that adult world, that you get to be, like, long-time listener, first-time caller, here's Dave Burgess, and this is so exciting, because he already knows our format and how this is all going to go. So, yay. So, I'm, I'm going to guess that maybe you want to hear a sweet and a sour? Yes! <laughs> let's go for it. So you can choose which order do you want to go, but yeah, let's, let's hear from the man himself. What you got going on today? Okay. So I'm going to go sweet first. And so my sweet is one of the things that's happened since the pandemic, which of course has been horrible, terrible, lots of tragedy, trauma, all these different things, but a sweet for me of the, this time period has been a real focus on wellness and fitness. And so I'm a person that was traveling from one place to another, always on a plane, eating in airports, eating in restaurants more often than not, uh, you know, getting late, late night to a hotel room and then pop, you know, doing an event, returning the rental car, popping onto a plane. And it was taking a toll on my health, I think. And so one of the things I've done is really had an intentional focus on my health, my wellness, my fitness. And so I can say, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, at age 54, that's right, I'm just going to go out there and put it out there. At age 54, I am right now in the best shape of my entire life. And so that's been something that I've been proud of. That's going to be my sweet uh, and my sour. So we kind of talked a little bit about this before we started recording. My sour is, uh, so I'm super excited about my podcast. I just started a podcast, The Dave Burgess Show. But it is coming with some major learning curves and audio quality and recording and the technology and all that kind of stuff behind this is going to be my sour because there was there have been multiple times over the past week where I have wanted to hurl my computer at the wall and see it smash into little smithereens. And it is even possible that some words have come out of my mouth this morning, in fact, uh, about this, some of these struggles with audio quality that uh, maybe are not podcast appropriate. Oh, I I think Brie and I can probably relate, and we t we did talk about this a little bit before recording. It's you think it's going to be so easy, you just get to hit record, and then all the like you just don't know all the nuance that goes into making high quality audio. And I mean, sometimes we're limited by the tools. You know, we're recording through Zoom. No disrespect, Zoom, but the means that we're recording is not going to sound the same as if we were in professional studio sitting across from each other with our own mics. Um, but but the content is what we want to focus on, right? So we, I know we want it to sound good, but we, we want, and you put out really good content. So I'm yeah, excited. And I kind of want to unpack this a little bit too, though, because it's also one of those things where, I mean, you know, Lenny, you said like, it's, it's, it is, yes, it's an easy enough project, right? Like we, we hit record and we go into it, but also for so many, it's a scary, scary moment because we put so much emphasis around, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a professional. I've never done this before, right? And so then you psych yourself up finally, right? You're like, okay, 
I've read enough self-help books. I've like put my little post-it note on the mirror. Like I'm, I'm smart enough. I can, I'm good enough. Like I can do this. People want to listen to me. I'm going to come in. I'm going to hit record. And then you have an experience where it doesn't come out the way that you want it to. And all the frustration that comes into that and how that can like really stress you out and, and trigger all of those things. And so I guess what I want to say is a big thank you, Dave, for being vulnerable with that, because even the pirate himself, who is a huge fan of technology, a huge fan of change, a huge fan of innovation, a huge fan of, of just hit play and try it and see what goes down, also struggles through some of these things and then wants to throw whatever tool at, you know, whatever hard object um, it, I think it's important for us to, to acknowledge that because so many times people might look to you um, and say, well, it's so easy. Dave, no, you know, Dave makes it look, Dave makes it look easy. He makes it look effortless. He makes it, you know, just all those pieces and, and really behind the curtain, you're, you're just, you're like one of us. I, I'm human. <laughs> yeah. And so there's been multiple times over the, over this stretch where, and this has happened, this happens to me a lot where but what I'll say to myself is like, wait a second, I talk about this stuff. Like this is in my keynote actually, like be prolific, not perfect. Perfectionism stifles creativity. Perfectionism limits creativity. Don't, and I actually, this is a part of my presentation, trying to get teachers to overcome perfectionism and to be prolific in their uh, creation and in their brainstorming. And then here I am sitting there. Now I have a project that I have to ship and it's, and it's just as hard for me to ship something too. And I go like, oh no, I can't send that into the world. That sound is just not quite right. And we're, I, you know, maybe I'll just, uh, just forget this whole podcast thing. And I see, wait a second, I'm doing it too. I just did this in my keynote yesterday and now look at me. And so it's so easy to fall into these traps where uh, I, I have that with my book sometimes too, where I think like, man, you know, I need to go back and read my book because if I would have read my dang book this this week, I wouldn't be struggling through, through some of this stuff. I'm gonna do that. It reminds me of um, a fantastic movie out there, Tombstone, right? You know, for those of us, like Texas Girl, we, we, we've watched, my family has watched a lot of Lonesome Dove, a lot of Tombstone, but in Tombstone, there is a part when um, Val Comer playing uh, uh, Doc Holliday looks up and says, my hypocrisy knows no bounds. And that is my phrase that I throw all the time with that as somebody who falls into that, right? Where it's like, I can tell everybody else, jump out there. It's okay. Go in here, lean into it, be willing to make those mistakes. But whenever it comes to my own, I get a little bit more protective of that perfectionist side of it. And, um, and yeah, it's a, it's a little bit harder, but um, I'll throw that phrase at myself. I'm sure Lainey has heard me say it multiple times of my hypocrisy knows no bounds whenever it comes to uh, do as I say, not as I do kind of thing whenever it comes to that. But you're putting yeah. out a fantastic product. So we appreciate it. Even um, though your very attuned ears might find some um, find some some room for improvement in some ways, but you're, you're doing some great things and we appreciate the work you're doing. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And then Steve Jobs, he said, real artists ship. Mm -hmm. And that's like, you know, that's the, you have to, you have, at some point you have to publish at some point you have to ship at some point you have to step in front of that audience for the first time and do that presentation or whatever it might be. Uh, if you're an artist, you have to overcome that desire to, to not share it with the world, keep it to yourself, and you have to ship it. And it's not always going to be perfect when you first ship it, but that's, that's you know, it's the iterations, it's yeah. the fine tuning. And um, that's, that's something that we talk to people about all the time because people will come to us and they'll say something like this. They'll say like, hey, I want to write a book and then I want to go speak. And I always say to them, wait, well, hold on, hold on. Let, let's switch that around. Go speak and then write a book. Because when you go speak and you put your work in front of an authentic audience, you get to see what resonates, what doesn't resonate. Same way writing a blog. Start blog first. Write your book second, right? Uh, podcast first, book second. Because then a real audience will give you feedback. You'll see those eyes staring at you when you're giving your presentation and you'll know what's hitting. You'll know what slide goes up that they put up that their, their camera want to get a picture of. You'll know afterwards they'll come up to you and say like, hey, I really love when you talked about this, but could you explain this part? And you say, oh my gosh, 
I actually need to flesh that out more as a part of my presentation. And it gives you a chance to hone and craft your message in front of a real audience. And then when you do something that seems more permanent, like a book, it's going to be a stronger project. So it's always about getting your work out in front of an authentic audience and then being willing to adapt, adjust and be flexible and, uh, say like this is just the first iteration this is this is test one but there's going to be other iterations of this afterwards i'm so glad you said that um i i find that sometimes i will be putting together a presentation and i'll have something in my mind and i'm like this is gonna blow them away they are gonna love this oh my gosh i'm so excited to share this with them and it's kind of like no one even like responds to it. It's just like, okay, that's interesting, next. And then the thing that I didn't think anyone would gravitate towards is the one, like you said, the cameras are up and they're taking pictures. And so that's such good advice. And also I think, um, I just wanna add one little thing because I've talked about comparison hangover on here before. And I think that sometimes we see other people, we see authors and we see people posting stuff on Twitter and we think like, oh, how do they put the good stuff out all the time? And it's like, well, they're putting a lot of stuff out. You're noticing the good stuff. You're gravitating towards the good stuff. And so I think it's it's really a good point to like put it out there, even if it's still soft set jello, see what people think and continue to work on it. I love that. Yeah, and, well, and it's, I, I can't remember exactly how this was put, but basically don't compare the beginning of your journey to the end of someone else's journey, right? So like if someone were to see sees, sees my keynote, like my keynote is on rails, okay? Like it's like, I've done it a lot of times, all right? And I know I can, you know, you want a 90 minute keynote? You want it to be a hundred minutes to 105? I know what to take out, what to put in. It's on rails, right? And so then someone else says, oh gosh, like I just feel like I'm stumbling over. I, I, it doesn't seem as smooth, like, well, okay. But I've given I've given this presentation for years, <laughs> you know? and so this is the end of my journey. And don't compare the beginning of yours to that. And uh, I, I think that's something that we're that's easy to forget. And then you mentioned or like social media is another example of that. Hey, people put their highlight reel on social yeah. media often, yeah. and um, so don't compare your real life with their highlight reel that they've cho chosen to share with you on social media. And that's, I think that comparison trap there is, is a, a also a huge trap. Absolutely. So much of this reminds me of, um, of, of the classroom though too, right? Like whenever, when you're first talking about that, of like when you go to a presentation and you're getting all of that feedback and you're making those tweaks and you're doing that, I mean, that's formative assessment 101, right? Like you're in the moment and you're finding out like, what are the parts that really matter? Like to Lainey's point of like, oh my gosh, I, I would have assumed that this one big thing that I was doing and pouring my heart and soul into, that didn't matter at all. And really what they got was this part that, you know, you kind of gloss over in your mind, but that's the most critical point. And I think back to, you know, back in the day of being in the classroom and seeing those same elements come out, right? And, and to your point too, over that comparison with, you know, what was working really, really well for one teacher, if I were to go and try to duplicate that exact same thing that they were doing, it would fall flat, right? Because my passion points are very different than their passion points. And, and my kids would know that. And, um, you know, whereas for, for me, if I'm going in there and I'm just, you know, kind of forcing the content out there, or is it, you know, whenever I really jump in and I, um, you know, find, whether it's discussing that novel or looking at, you know, those analysis techniques or whatever that is. And, and you get to be really fired up with your kids and your kids, all of a sudden, that's when they, they start to understand how it works instead of just forcing them at this one thing that, that they, uh, you know, they've seen work successfully somewhere else. So I think there's so much in what you've just shared over podcasting and putting yourself out there that we have to remember when we're talking about education is it's that that time where you're you've got to put yourself out there right like otherwise we're social creatures like whether it's putting yourself out there by trying something new in your classroom or whether it's putting yourself out there by you know presenting at a conference or applying for a position or whatever it is you've got to share that content out there and then you've got to look at it and see what's going to be the best opportunities um to to improve that for the next time because it should always be that continual um that continual re revisitation right like the design thinking opportunities that come out of it absolutely and like i would in, in, in my book, I wrote 
the, if you walk away from this book thinking that I don't have any behavior management issues in my classroom or that all of my lessons are successful or that I never have a kid sneaking a text in their lap or mm-hmm. you know, looking out the window and you know, staring longingly thinking about what they're going to do after school or something like that, I'm giving you the wrong impression. You know, this is not about uh, any sort of reaching some, some nirvana level perfection or anything like that. It's about getting better and constantly improving and having that growth mindset and we talk to kids about growth mindset all the time. Kid says, I'm not good at math. We say, oh, no, wait, hold on. You're not good at math yet, right? Or if a student came up to us and said, hey, uh, I don't feel comfortable speaking in front of the class. We would never say to that student, oh, yeah, I understand. That's totally a thing. Just go sit quietly in the corner all year. Like, we would never say that. We will work with them, build their confidence, uh, help them with their skills, give them closer and closer approximations of what we want them ultimately to be able to accomplish so they could build some momentum and get better at it and better at it and then get them to a place where they do feel comfortable doing what we ultimately want them to do. But we have to have that same focus on our own work as well. And so if a growth mindset is good for students, it's good for educators as well. And understanding that all progress is found outside of your comfort zone. So if you're never uncomfortable as an educator, then you're probably not growing at the rate that you could be. And so it's always about pushing that edge and just trying to get a little better. Yeah, I love that. Hey, I want to, um, I've shared this word, I think, on the podcast before, but equifinality, you know, that we're, we can end up with the same good results, even though we had different ways of getting there. In the end, it's the same, but the way we got there is different. And some of the things I'm hearing as I'm processing what you all are saying, it really connects to what you've talked about in your first episode of your podcast. And I wonder if you could maybe expand on that a little bit, this live wide, read wide, because I love this idea of taking things that are happening beyond the scope of just education and thinking about how we can apply it to our work because there isn't just one way to do things so we can learn things from other um, industries from other you know parts of the world there's so much that we can kind of take it and passion points Bree, i really like perked up when you said that because i was like that's so true a lot of times we say hey try this well that might not work for someone that might not be their style um but i would love it if you're if you're up for it share a little bit about that because i thought that was a really interesting topic yeah, so for sure. And, and that, whole, that whole idea of the passion points and what works for you might not work for someone else. And that's, that's a big part of kind of the teach like a, like a pirate mentality is that people, sometimes people mis, mischaracterize it as teaching a certain way. It's not teaching a certain way. It's about embracing the idea that what's unique about you, your particular strengths and talents in your voice that you bring to your classroom is what's gonna make you most successful. So it's embracing your, your strengths and talents, your voice, and then seeking to empower students through their voice and through their strengths and talents as well, right? So it's not one particular system. In fact, uh, it reminds me of, uh, I wrote something about classroom Kung Fu. So Bruce Lee, was the, this incredible martial artist. Most people know him because of his movies, right? But he was actually a very incredibly deep philosophical thinker about all things, including the martial arts. And he grew up learning Wing Chun Kung Fu, which was a highly formalized system of Kung Fu where you learn certain forms and like, you know, uh, you do moves in a certain order and all these kind of things like this. And at some point he realized that, hey, I am so in, I am so trapped by my for, by my, my style of Kung Fu that I see people, like I see people that they get trapped, they reject things that are outside of their style, even if they're effective. And so they, someone might come up and say like, oh, that's a really good kick, but I do, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I do jujitsu, we don't, you know, we don't use kicks. Or another person says, oh, I love that hold. That, that, that submission hold, but I'm in Taekwondo. So you know, whatever, you know, that's not what we, that's not gonna, and it's like, wait a second, hold on. No, what we wanna do is take the best of everything. And how are we gonna judge the best of everything? What he said is if for its effectiveness in combat for us, but for, what, for what's best for kids and what's gonna help kids learn. I don't wanna reject something because it's not my teaching style. If it's effective, I wanna take the best from all of these different teaching styles and create what he created something called Jeet Kondo, which was his own style. It's not even a style. 
basically the style is I'm going to take the best of everything and then I'm going to call it this, right? And he was even nervous that after he died, that people were going to try to formalize his style, which was never the point in the first place, right? And so I think that's how we have to look at education is don't, you don't have to declare a style. You don't have to be a certain type of teacher. Like take the best of everything, learn from everybody based on its effectiveness with your students and then put that together, make that your style. And that's the whole idea of the live wide, read wide is I, I, most of my stuff comes from outside of education. I'm not the person that spends all my time in the education section of the bookstore, even though I publish education books. I want to read from everywhere. I want to draw from other industries and bring those ideas in. And that's going to, what, what's effective in another industry is going to be especially innovative when you look at it in your industry, because other people aren't, everyone's doing the same stuff. But when you look outside and bring it in, all of a sudden it's a new source of creative ammunition. So, so I get like super fired up about all of this stuff because there are so many things that I want to come in here and, and Lainey's like, oh Lord, this is going to be a long episode because Bree's going to get like really geeked out over this. So number one, first thing that popped into my mind when you were telling this was also you shared this um, in your, in your, your episode one um, on your, on your podcast was you and I both are former basketball coaches and, um, you know, we're talking about being, uh, you know, learning the motion offense and all of this. Right. And so, um, I, I think about this so often whenever we're talking about curriculum in the classroom, right. Because you can tell so many people that will be like, okay, well, we're going to do, we're going to teach this book or we teach this philosophy or we teach, you know, this content or whatever it is. And, um, and it reminds me of being a coach and kind of coming in and, and, as a coach, you typically, if you're going to be very successful, you can't just be like, all I, you know, I am Coach Burgess and all I run is emotion offense. Like no matter what, it doesn't matter because at some point in time, you're going to go up against the defense that's going to shut your motion down, or you're going to have a team that their strengths might not, you know, reflect that offense. And, um, and it reminds me of, you know, I was, when I was coaching, um, I thought that I knew every single offense known to me. And like, I just, you know, I was like, oh man, I know all of these. This is great. This is great. Well, we, we got a new coach um, coming in at the varsity level this one particular year. And so he brought us all in and he was like, all right, here's what I want to do. And he had been a, a boys coach and he moved over into girls because um, number one, because his, he had daughters himself and he wanted to, he realized at some point in time that he would always be on opposite schedules of his daughters. And so he wanted, you know, to really kind of be there with them. And so he was already bringing in some different ideas, um, you know, coming into that. And so then he told us, he's like, we're going to run um, this, this offense that's called read and react. And I was like, never heard of this before. Right. And so we start digging in, we're going through all of this stuff and basically read and react is algorithmic basketball. And so it's all based off of like, if you do this, then you do this. Like if your defense steps over the three point line, then you immediately do a back cut. If you're, and it's, it's constantly judging off of what that system is instead of forcing something that may have been successful in the past for you, or may have been successful in the past for someone else, but trying to make it work in that system. And I think that that is you know, so much of what you're talking about with this, like you're pulling from all of the greatness. Like that's basically what read and react is, is all the great, you know, moves and, and, um, and styles of basketball. And it puts it all together off of, of what's happening there. And, you know, so much of that is, is what we want to do. We're constantly as teachers and as educators pulling from our, our toolbox and our experiences and our suitcases and our, our situations in order to meet the needs of what's right there in front of us. And I think that that, you know, is just, it's so incredibly true because like you said, I mean, I've lost count. I don't know if you know it off of the top of your head, how many books that you've published, but if you're a brand new teacher and you go and you, if you think you're going to go to the bookstore and grab how, you know, grab teach like a pirate and that become your manual of like, this is, you know, these are the, these are the seven ingredients that you need. And these are the five lessons that you will teach. And then you will have success with every single one of your students you're missing the point of it, right? You've instead, you've got to breathe in the philosophy and understand when to make the adjustments that you need to based off of, you know, that overall strategy that's coming in. Yeah, and so I could geek out on the, the motion office for a long time. I'm trying to, I'll try not to go too deep on this, but there's a whole, I have a whole episode coming on. So I, I just mentioned a couple of things. So what you said, like with the read and react and all that. So true motion offense 
is not a set. So I think there's two basic philosophies of, of coaching basketball. And I fall very firmly in one camp and I think it has a good classroom applications too. And that basically you have to decide early on, am I going to teach basketball plays or am I going to teach kids to play basketball? Yeah. And I want to teach. Can we, kids can we just pause that. for a second and say that is exactly? I mean, so we can push that into technology too, right? Like, am I going to teach my kids how to use technology, or am I going to use technology to teach and 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 learn and do all of that kind of stuff? Right? Am I going to learn to use technology, or am I going to use technology to learn? So, sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> and so there are some coaches that they teach basketball plays. They come down and they run a certain play, and it's a very formalized thing, much like Bruce Lee was talking about, like this move comes after this move, after this move, after this move, after this move. And I don't want my kids to come down and run some scripted pattern or anything like that. I want my kids to come down and read what is happening in front of them. I want them when they go set a screen, we teach very explicitly, hey, so if the defense goes underneath the screen, then we're gonna use this cut. If the defense is, you know, is uh, if they switch the screen, then we're gonna slip it and roll to the basket, whatever it might be, right? If they follow you around the screen, I want you to curl cut tight and, and, and go to the basket. and like, all these different things that we're teaching them and so there's no one way to play uh to, to the, the play's going to look when it comes down the court and not that's scary as a coach that's scary because you are empowering your players to react at the moment and to read and to adjust and to adapt it's much easier as a coach to say no if i call this out i know my kids are going to go here 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 and here here right that's the easy way to do it but the hard way the empowering way is to say, no, I want to teach my kids the principles of movement, how to space the court, how to read the defense, all of these different things, and then allow them to play the game as it comes to them. And I told them early in the season, I've done this a coaching class before, where I say that, listen, I do not, I would not care if my competition sat in on every single one of the practices that we have. They can watch me install the motion, motion offense. I don't care because it's not gonna help them. Because my kids, no matter what your kids do, my kids are gonna read, react and adjust to it. And so the, you, don't, the, you, you can't learn our plays, we don't have them. We have principles, that's what we have. We have principles of movement that we're gonna use against you, right? And so as an educator, I think about that, where it's so easy to get tied in, well, here's the lesson, or here's the scripted curriculum, or here's what we want kids to do, or we do a project, but all the projects look the same, you know? And no, that's not what we wanna do. We wanna empower kids to adjust, adapt, and to change and be willing to change depending on what's thrown in front of them. We don't know what the world's going to, this is a perfect example, 2020, 2021. We don't know what the world's going to look like in a couple of years from now. Who knows what's going to be the most useful skills to have a couple of years from now. We're in a global pandemic, right? And so what we want kids to do though, is be empowered to be learners yeah. and to learn how to adjust and be flexible. And so I think it has a, that coaching philosophy impacts the classroom as well. Well, now, now my coaching experience is non-existent. So with the exception of binge watching Ted Lasso, I really have nothing more to add to the um, coaching analogies, but, but, I, but I do completely agree with what you're saying. And, and, and I want my kids, my own, all kids, but also my own personal children to learn how to learn more than I want them to learn content. That is so much more important to me because we don't know what content is going to be important. But we know we can find content if we have the skills to find, validate, and effectively use it, synthesize it, and all that. Bree, what were you going to say? Well, as, so much, so much, but I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, but what I, you know, number one, I think that you know what you what you both just articulated is that there is a huge difference, right? So the 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 one that focuses on plays, or the one that focuses on here are the um here are the 50 capitals or, you know, here, like, I'll, I'll never forget somebody bringing me in and asking, you know, it was a teacher that I actually had grown up with and she taught across, she taught across the hallway for me. And so she comes in one day and she was like, I got to know something. And I was like, well, okay. She goes, how do you teach prepositions? And I was like, what do you mean? How do I teach prepositions? And she was like, you know, like, what is it that you do to teach prepositions? And I was like, are you kidding me? And she was, I was like, okay, let me ask you, like, what do you do to teach prepositions? And she was like, I give them the 156 words. And I, you know, like I, I tell them like, this is what, it is. and if they would just, you know, we, we kind of walk through and they have to memorize them and they have to do all this stuff. And she was like, so what do you do? And I started laughing and I was like, um, did you not have Miss Wesson in sixth grade? And she kind of looked at me and I was like, I teach the way that Miss Wesson did, which was she told us it's anywhere a cat can go. That's what a preposition is. Preposition is about proximity and its location. And so all you do is you say a cat can go up 
a cat can go over, a cat can go through, a cat can go around, a cat can go, you know, replace it for whatever it is that you want. But why I share that is because the first version of that is the memorized version. That is not learning. That is regurgitation. That is trying to keep a very specific set of, of quote unquote facts or quote unquote, you know, like whatever that content is that can only be looked at through one singular lens, that's not learning. That's just doing school or compliance or regurgitation or whatever it is that we want to call it. Whereas if you're teaching them and I, and I go back to Dave, when you were talking about like as a coach, how scary it is to totally like let it run them up with these kids out there. Right. And like, we can't walk out on the court and tell them that they're wrong. Cause we're going to get technical when that happens. Not that I would have ever had that happen to me, but I mean, still, you know, we can't do that. Like it's not allowed for us to go and do that for them. And so you suddenly have to empower them to learn, not to know, but to learn. And, and what, you know, what wraps all of that up together for me um, is there's this fantastic research out there that talks about why do we do a better job of teaching computers to do math than we do our own children? And it talks about how what we do when we're teaching our own kids math, we focus on the memorization of formulas. And so it comes down to like, do you know the Pythagorean theorem? Do you know how to find area? Do you know how to like, and it's all of this stuff. And I'm watching my kids like go through this, you know, in action. And right now it like brings up my like own sweaty palms and all of this stuff, because that's really not a good way for the majority of people to learn. Because again, all you're doing is you're forcing memorization instead of teaching why it's there. But what we do with computers is that we teach algorithmically. And so we say, if this happens, then this is what's going to happen. And then this, and so it builds upon and scaffolds that knowledge as we go through. And that's where number one, you feel success because you start to understand it. But then number two, you continue with being able to handle anything that gets thrown at you because now you know it. And those principles are things that you can apply instead of just having that one slice or one lens of information. So I think even, you know, I mean, Lainey, we'll throw you, we'll throw you a line of even not having that basketball side of it, you know, like you, you see it as, I mean, it's, it's evident in so many principles of, of education, but we, we forget it because we just want to present the thing that we know that we're comfortable with, that we've seen success with. And then we get nervous when we have to look at it from a different perspective. Hey, so one of the side benefits of coming on the podcast is I think maybe I understand prepositions better now. <laughs> Brie is a wealth of knowledge and <laughs> strategies that are highly effective. That is, Brie is, I'm constantly learning from her. I, I so, so, so Lainey, I have to ask permission for something. Am I allowed to make one more uh, basketball reference? I mean, okay. No, I'm just kidding. I would love to hear it. I would love to hear it. And then I want to, I know we're starting to run out of time. I want to hear that. And then I do want to talk a little bit more about this live wide, read wide, because I do think like Brie did not start as an educator. So I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about that, but I want to hear, yes, I do. Thank you for asking okay. permission. What a kind guest you are. Wow. <laughs> okay. So here's the, here's the thing. Uh, what I, one of the things that I think that you both have been talking about, which is super powerful, is that it's, um, it's the skill, we want them to know the skills, how to learn. And, and it's like the skills that they're, gonna, that they're gonna need to then be able to do all sorts of things. And we don't know what they're gonna go do, but we know what are gonna be effective learning strategies that they're gonna be able to implement no matter what they choose. And so I was thinking about this, we, we were playing a game against a team. We were much better than this team, okay? And I mean, significantly better but, than this team. And partway through the game, I turned to my assistant coach and I said, I think that's like the 15th out of bounds play that they've just run against us. Okay. Like literally they had 15 out of bounds plays. I have like three, two, three. Right. And then we just adjust based on what they do. Right. But so I'm like, wait a second. These kids have been spent all their practice time learning all these out of bounds plays of all things. Right. Like how, if I had this, if I was coaching that team, the first thing I do is, we learn how to jump stop. We learn how to <laughs> dribble and pass. I think that that's probably a little more important for this team to work on than uh, learning in the, a 15th and 16th out of bounds play. Like these kids can't even jump stop, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, wait a second. Let's, let, what are the fundamental skills that we want kids to know? And when you don't have all that focus on 
this, this relentless drive that I have to get this far in my curriculum and cover all these different things, all kind of stuff like that. But you can focus on this. That gives you more time to focus on those powerful things, those skills. It's kind of like the person that thinks they're doing project-based learning, but, uh, but really they're not. They've just called it project-based learning. And it's... Uh, you know, and so I think that's an important thing. But now to go this live and wi- this live wide thing, read wide thing. I was late to the game of education. Um, I had I tried all sorts of stuff before I w- became an educator, and I think that was something that was important for me because it gave me a different perspective, an outside lens to look on education um, from. And so I love the idea of that live wide, read wide. And I think we force kids to specialize too early. Like some of these some of these places. You know, they'll go to a 14 year old and they're asking them to choose a career path. You know, like here's what you can go this, this track here, this track here, this track here, and it's gonna influence their curriculum. A 14 year old is choosing a career path because I didn't know what I was gonna do in my twenties. But yet we try to like, we pigeonhole people, I think too early rather than, uh, and force them to specialize too early. But so I was late to the game of education as well. Um, although I, I would look at it a little bit differently because I believe everything, regardless of your industry, is related to education. Because I think that that's part of what we are all doing. Like it's part of our natural communication, right? It's taking our information and, and sharing it and teaching it and, and learning from others. Um, that said, I would venture. I know I know a little bit enough about Dave Burgess to know that you taught history. So what did you make, what was your undergrad in? Let's just play a little like 21 questions here real quick. It won't be 21, but what was your undergrad in? And I'm going to guess that it was a humanities type thing, but I could be wrong. You you are not going to be surprised at all at what my undergrad was. I was a psychology major. Me too. (laughs) Look at you, see? Nerds unite. Yes. Like this is awesome. So the reason, and I kind of had a feeling it was going to be somewhere in, in a humanities type thing, because I was, so a little insight into me. Um, I come from a very long line of, um, of science people, like super, super science people. Um, we could, we could get lost in a lot of that, but like, um, and, and, and so I am the, my mom likes to refer to me as like our family's lone little liberal arts major, right? Like I went to the university of Texas and I measured in English literature and, um, my, my math class was called math and it's, spirit and use. And, um, and so my family likes to like poke at me because they're engineers and, and science people and all of that. But, um, I still to this day believe that, one of the most powerful majors that we can have is the liberal arts kind of mindset because we are, it's not set on content. Like, and, and I'll, I'm probably going to get some hate mail over this and that's okay. Like I can take it. But um, when STEM and all of that started coming out, I, um, I typically will talk through it and I'll be like, yeah, we had STEM, which was science, technology, engineering, and math. And then we got started, started thinking about it and we were like, oh, well now we need to add an A because we got to have arts in there. So we had, and then we made it to STEAM and then we changed it to stream. And the problem is, is that that's called learning folks. Like that's what it, it's, it's just, how do we take all of this and we bring it in so that we're constantly doing that in education. We've, we've categorized it. We've said there's math and then there's reading and then there's science. And then there's, and we've tried to push them all too far apart. But um, I, 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 to bring us back into our conversation, I think that when you have an awareness of so many other things that are going on in our world, it moves you from being super zoned in and like tunnel visioned on content, but instead it allows you to apply your knowledge. So for me, for example, my very first year teaching, I've shared the story a million times. I had the kid who raised his hand in the back and was like, why do we need to know this miss? Right. Actually, he knew not to call me miss. He called me miss coach, but that was a different story. And so he was like, why do we need to know this, Miss Coach? And um, I looked at him and I ex- completely, I thought that that was such an important question, right? Like, and the answer is not because it's on tomorrow's exam. The answer is not because it's in this curriculum plan for the six weeks. The answer was because at some point in time, you are going to ask for a raise from your boss and you need to be able to eloquently present with a, with an argumentation st- technique 
that's going to help you get there. And all of a sudden he was like, I'm in, like, how do I, what do I need to do in order to do that? And so I, where, where I think that we sometimes forget by not reading wide or by not living wide is what are those real world connotations and conceptuals that are going to go on that even told us why we need to know ethos, pathos, and logos to begin with, right? Like we didn't just randomly decide to start teaching argumentation. We started teaching argumentation in order to provide context so that kids would be able to do X, Y, and Z in, in the real world. And if you don't know the real world, it's hard to explain that. Absolutely true. And I think I was thinking about something that Seth Godin said the other day. I was listening to Seth Godin talk, who's one of my favorite authors. And uh, again, that's an example of reading wide, right? Most of the books I read, I, uh, I'm probably gonna get in trouble in saying this because I publish education books, but a lot of the books I read are outside of education. Mm -hmm. And so I was listening to Seth talk and he talked about the difference between what, how people play with Legos in the past and now. Ooh. And I thought it was something that had good implications for school as well. Is that what happened? What used to be when you grew up, you used to get a whole bunch of Legos and you would create something, you would build something, you would make something up. Well, now when you buy a Lego set, you get this precise instruct these precise instructions, and you build the model to look exactly like the picture on the front. And if it doesn't look like the picture on the front, it was a, a failure. So they provided you this complete recipe. This is what we want you to build and make. And then now go go create with Legos. Well, that's not really creating. <laughs> that's following a, that's following a recipe. And that's when I, I, I mentioned the project based learning thing earlier too. It's like, well, I'm doing project based learning. All the kids are doing this. <laughs> well, that's not really the whole point of it, right? And so we need to spend more time where we're giving kids the proverbial Legos and allowing them to put them the way, put them together and make connections in, in, in unique and creative ways. And can I just say, as a parent who has a son who loved Legos, once they know there's a step-by-step -step recipe, you can't, you can't walk that back because now they go, well, what I make is never going to look as good as that. And I just want to follow those steps because I want it to be really, really good. And so it, it's a lot to do with education because, you know, when we start to rethink the models of education, not just in this global pandemic, but even before that with blended learning and online learning, it was this very intentional rethinking of, of time and space to allow learners to have that agency. And you like you let that genie out, but you still have to actually nudge learners to get there. It's not like, and I know I've said this before, it's not like you say, okay, guys, we're going to start doing flipped classroom and there's the, the slow clap and the mic drop moment. It's no, a lot of learners are like, mm -mm, I, I knew how to do the Legos with the directions for the recipe. Like you want me to just play with Legos? Like that's a really, really hard shift. And so I'm really optimistic that on the other side of this, we do come out that way, but what a great example. I love that Legos example. And, and so Lainey, you said something that was super important and that's that it's not just hard for the teachers, oh. it's, that it's hard for the kids too, because they have learned to go through school. Hey, here are the hoops that I can jump through. And if I do this, this, and this, I know I will get this grade. And they are comfortable in that position. And they're like, hey, wait. And then all of a sudden you say, no, that's not the way that this class works. This class is going to be more about innovation and creativity. Like they, they want the rubric. No, no, no. What do I have to do to get an A? Say, well, that's not the way this is going to happen in this, in this class. And they are the, a lot of times the students will also be resistant. It's not just teachers will be resistant, teaching that way sometimes, but students are like, no, no, no. Like, like, in fact, I have seen this before. If you say to a group of students, hey, listen, you can do this creative project or you could do this more like formal assessment, just like we've been doing in the past. Some students will say, I don't want to do the creative project. Just give me like, give me the, the test. I'm a, I'll pass the test. Right. And so you have to overcome some of that student resistance too, because they're so used to having, having been grown up and been successful in that system. And then now all of a sudden you're coming along and throwing them out of their comfort zone as well. Yep. And that's a learned thing that happens. They don't come to us in kindergarten like that. That's something that they've learned over the years, which is why it's even harder to make that shift um, with the high school and the middle school students, for sure. Well, and we see that implication as it continues on, right? Like, so, uh, so many of us hear about, um, you know, after high school, then when they're in, um, you know, if they're at the university level, then all of a sudden we're here from university. Oh, kids aren't prepared for, for the creative thinking, for the complexities of, of, of school. Well, 
it's, it's because maybe we've spent too much time asking for that, um, that, that, you know, providing that single lens of this is what you will have to do. And, and it's almost kind of, like you said, prescribed and regimented for them. So then we can't, it's really hard to make that shift whenever you get to, to college because they've been accustomed to this. This is how they know how to be successful, all of that kind of stuff. Well, if they're not in the university setting, then what does that look like in, in, you know, in, in college or excuse me, in corporate or, or, you know, in that, um, in, in the work setting. And you, that's one of those pieces that I've, I've also shared a lot with college students, as well as with, uh, you know, teachers in, in, in K-12 is that you've got to understand, like when you go to, to work, the person that is valuable in work is not the person who's going to open a textbook and say, this is how we should, this, this is the exact way that we do it. The person who's valuable in the work setting is the person who comes up with a new and innovative way of doing it. They, it's the person who Apollo 13s it, right? Like that comes in and says, okay, this is the, the problem that we have, because if it's a problem, then we need to fix it, right? Shout out to a little, uh, to, to a little vanilla ice there. But at the same time, it's not going to be one of those like, oh, this is a problem. You know, we're not trying to fix things that don't need to be fixed. Those are the great things. Those become the practices that stay in place. It's the problems that we need to find new um, solutions to. And we can't do that if all we've ever done is the exact same thing over and over and over again. Can I just give a quick acknowledgement of the deep reach for the vanilla ice reference that was real magic I, mean, for me. I don't know about i had to because like for, if, if you're not watching on the video i had to because dave is wearing a live your excellence shirt which is a shout out to the one and only my brother from another mother jimmy process and um you know jimmy jams like we have to have some kind of reference to music when when we have jimmy um and, you know even in even in our hearts or spirits so yeah I have Thank to you. feel. I have to feel that he'd be upset that the reference was Vanilla Ice, though. And if he if he's not upset by that, I'm disappointed. He will be. You're going to make process. sure that he is, no matter what. Yeah. But hey, at least at least it was there. And, and I mean, Vanilla Ice is a Texan, so I got to go with something here. So okay. um, give, me, give me a moment. <laughs> well, so I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, someone too, and that is. Uh, one of my former bosses who was really so innovative, Steve Glyer, and he would send us to conferences. I think he, I think people thought he was bananas, but he would send us to conferences where were not education at all. He would send us to podcasting conferences so we could learn about storytelling and how to get your message out there. He sent us to gaming conferences, like years, light years before Kahoot was even a glimmer in someone's brain. And so he had these, these thoughts of like, no, we can learn things from outside of education and we should bring those in. And we would do book studies, Jim Collins, Good to Great, still one of my absolute favorites, uh, that concept of the flywheel. Like there's so much we can pull from with this idea of live wide and read wide. And so I love that topic for you. We, luckily there was no overlap, all new content here. So everyone should check out your first episode of the podcast where you talk about that. Is there any other teasers you want to give us for the podcast? I know that we're rec we're recording kind of early because it was hard. You know, we had to book you way in advance, um, so we're gonna we're gonna get this out as soon as possible. But uh, what what's happening with the podcast? Yeah. So uh, depending though upon whether or not I can get those bumpers to record correctly, will depend on the podcast. But by the time that people are listening to this, hopefully that's all straightened out, and there will be lots of episodes available. It's the Dave Burgess Show. And it's everywhere that you listen to podcasts. And uh, it's going to be some standalone episodes with just me talking about topics. And then there's going to be also lots of interviews. And I just did the first interview this week. And it is with Principal L, Salom Thomas L uh, from, Phil from Philadelphia. He's one of my edu heroes. Uh, I love him. I love his energy. I love his message, his charisma, and his mentorship of his students and staff. And I love everything about Salam Thomas L, Principal L, as he's affectionately known. And so that's going to be the first uh, interview episode. And uh, hopefully there'll be lots more by the time that people are tuning into this. And it's not going to be your, uh, the typical thing. It's not, we're not going to just talk education. Just like today, we talked a little basketball. We talked a little bit of this. That's hopefully the way the Dave Burr show will be as well, is that we're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of topics. And we're going to um, really try to embrace that live wide, read wide philosophy. I, I love that so much. Um, I am so grateful, Brie. You know, we talk about this all the time. What a joy it is to do this podcast. Obviously, I love being with you here, Brie, but also to get to talk to people that I have looked up to, whose books I've read, who um, are, and I just, I know you probably get tired of people like 
gushing over you about how you amplify other people's voices, but it's super important. And I just thank you for doing that. Thank you for all you're doing for educators, stretching our thinking, amplifying those voices, and just, I don't know. Thank you. That's all I got. Thank you. It's absolutely my pleasure. I love bo both of your work and how you've amplified people through the podcast and what you do so on a regular basis is fantastic. And so anything I can do to get more people to listen and to tune in, I'm happy to do that. You've done so much. <laughs> I think this is, I mean, I'm, I'm super excited. I think it's one of those pieces where like just this conversation truly exemplifies like the more, I mean, 80s, 90 kids unite, unite, right? Like the more you know, the more you grow kind of thing where it's like the more information that you have that you're pulling from all different kinds of things. I mean, this is education 101, like the root of it, right? Of, of the reason why we have word problems in math was because we were supposed to be like pulling from real things that were going on in order to apply it. Um, and, and so I love this idea of just of, of keeping that going. Like read things, live things, bring that into your classroom, bring that into your, um, your educational principles, um, both inside education and outside education, and we're going to go a long way. So I, I'm super excited that you joined us and, and helped bring a lot of this to life for us and, and certainly charged us with uh, living wide and, and reading wide. So thanks, Dave. So Absolutely. one more thing, and then I promise I'm going to let us, let us all go, but um, I didn't, I don't think we ever clearly said this. We've thanked you so many times um, in other conversations that you really have amplified this podcast. I think more than, is it fair to say anyone, Brie? Like you tweet about our episodes, you really do on social media, um, really pop us up and we are so grateful for that. Thank you so much. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Like I said, I'm a fan of the show. Now a guest on the show, how exciting is that? It's uh, awesome. And, and Dave, how can people connect with you on the off chance that they're not already following you? <laughs> yeah, so you can find me on Twitter. I am at Burgess Dave. My name just flipped around to Burgess Dave. I am on Instagram at DBC underscore INC. On Instagram, you also have to put up with some fitness posts and sunsets and things like that, but also education posts. Uh, and uh, you can find me at daveburgess.com and you can find all of our books and everything at daveburgessconsulting.com. I love and it. And the Dave Burgess Show, the Dave Burgess Show podcast. Don't forget about the Dave Burgess Show podcast. And I, I love that you're sweet with uh, fitness. I thought that was great. All right, Bree, are we good? Should we let people? Yeah. Yeah. Like I have to go process all of this. My brain is just I know right now. So I'm so, so, so Brie, when are we starting our, our, our basketball coaching podcast? Oh my gosh. I would be all for it. Like you have no idea. Like seriously, if Lainey would let us, we could have like a whole nother hour and a half just to talk about all the, all the things that, that come into this. And um, yeah. Yeah. I thought you were going to like challenge me to a one-on-one -on -one game. I was going to be like, dude, I'll dominate. Like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. So I'm game anytime. Like literally let me know. Let's do this. It would be so fun for sure. All right. When this is over, I will be watching as you two play some one-on-one. -on -one. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I'll get together. Uh, Dave, you and I are pretty close because you're in San Diego. I'm just in Huntington Beach. So we'll, we're going to make Brie come to us. Does that seem fair? I think that's, I think you should both come to me because I'm in Hawaii right now. Oh, okay. you're okay. You know, my mom lives there, so maybe I'll make that the, the, the twofer. Yep, I'll go. That's a, that's a good, like, neutral territory kind of thing. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, All I right. like it. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Dave. All right. Thanks, Thanks. y'all. Thanks for everyone. See ya. If you enjoyed this batch of Lemonade Learning, please check out our website, LemonadeLearning.us, for more resources. Be sure to subscribe today so you don't miss out on future lessons, laughter, or lemonade. And if you're feeling really generous, please go to Apple Podcasts to submit a review so other educators know the value. One last thing, learning and lemonade are best together. So please connect with us on social media using the hashtag lemonade learning to share your story. Plus we're always looking to give away stickers and swag. <laughs>